What do you do in a condition of crisis to change the population? How do you win over the population to act in their own interests at a point when a lot of people are just beginning to discover that maybe everything isn't all peachy keen and, and great for the economy and great for their future? And so that's, that's what I'm going to cover, and in particular, what Lynn has been talking about in recent days, about how you turn tragedy to the sublime. So we'll have to talk a little bit about what real tragedy is, and then about this concept of the sublime. So let me start with Lynn in Berlin. Okay, here we go. I want to finish a couple of things that Lynn had said. He talked about why they want war. Now, I'm not saying this is why Cheney wants war. I don't know about Cheney. Cheney is, is really one of these guys who, who is way out there in a number of ways. But the, the impetus for war comes from the desire to stop a policy that's on the verge of being implemented that Lynn drafted when he was thrown in jail in, in the, the late 1980s and early 1990s, which was the idea of a strategic triangle between Russia China and India. We've erroneously reported in our briefing several times recently that the person who's responsible for this policy is former Russian Prime Minister Yevgeny Primakov. Now, Primakov did support the policy, but it was Lin's idea. And it was Lin who brought this idea forward to the Russian people who gave it to Primakov. The idea that a, a collapsing Russia after the fall of communism had an alternative to accepting the free trade looting that was given to Russia by the International Monetary Fund and the Harvard bankers. And that alternative was that Russia, China, and India could be linked up by high-speed rail, large-scale transfer of capital goods and technology that would come from Japan and Europe and possibly even the United States and that the area between the three, which included the Central Asian states, including Afghanistan, as well as Pakistan, India, that, that that could be a zone of economic development instead of warfare. And then coming off of that, you could connect the whole thing with the Eurasian land bridge from China to Europe, down through Iran, down through the Middle East, into Africa. And so that it was a starting point or a starter kit, you might say for the full Eurasian land bridge, which was Lin's policy. So in other words, instead of war, instead of a war between the Palestinians and the Israelis, instead of a war between Pakistan and India, instead of chaos among so-called Muslim fundamentalists in Central Asia against pro-Russian governments, instead of that, you could have a zone of economic development based on these transport corridors that would then be used to bring the West out of its depression through the export, both of the goods used in the railroads themselves, but also in the economic development of the region. So an economic development policy of peace. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, this is the hundred year fighting point of the Anglo-American financial elite. They look at Central Asia, and instead of seeing a zone of economic development, they see raw materials that they want. They look at China, and instead of seeing a potentially large trade partner, they see the next threat after the Islamic world. Their view is axiomatically that of the clash of civilizations. Now, what do we mean by axioma axiomatically? That they look at the world through this idea of... Thomas Hobbes. They are Hobbesians. Hobbes wrote in his one of his essays called The Leviathan that man is a beast, that we are by nature creatures that wish to devour each other, that wish to grab up whatever we can for ourselves, and that you cannot have peace between these competing ideas different factions. Hobbes basically was the one who wrote what Darwin is given credit for. Darwin's theory of evolution, that it's a jungle out there, it's a battle for the survival of the fittest, 
that really came from Hobbes more than 200 years earlier. And what Hobbes writes is that there is no compelling common interest even within an individual society. That is, if you have a society of all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, they're still going to want to kill each other to get each other's goods. Much less if you throw in a couple of people of darker skin into that population. Then you're really going to get things going. You throw compelling or competing interests, and you might get the whites to gang up on the blacks or the blacks on the whites. But even if you had a lily-white society of all Bushes and Harrimans and Rockefellers, they would still try and kill each other, which of course they did when there was almost a lily-white society in the northern United States in the beginning of the 20th century. And they made up the robber barons trying to kill and steal from each other. So this view says clash of civilizations is inevitable. There's no common interest for mankind. There's no such idea as the general welfare. Now, we start from the standpoint that there is a general welfare. But that means we think mankind is different. We think that man is a being of reason. That man is capable of recognizing that an individual's self-interest rests with the improvement of the society as a whole. And that if you understand that, then for you to get something from someone else to make yourself more comfortable ultimately is going to create tension and problems within that society. Now, this is an important concept because we saw this at the hearings yesterday, didn't we? You get all these groups that are getting the budget knife put to their throat. The people who are fighting to keep the funds for autism and for cerebral palsy and for the mentally retarded and for this group and that group. And they all come together in a budget hearing and what do they say? Oh, my group is the most worthy of all. You can't cut our funds. And what they're really saying is cut someone else's funds. So they're reduced to being part of a Hobbesian jungle, aren't they? That's what happens. That's how budget fights, budget cutting succeeds. You pit the people who are interested in, in protecting the, the uh, foster children. You pit them against the people who are going to try to help the indigent elderly. Now, who can argue who's more deserving? All human beings deserve protection from disease, from hunger. They, they, they're deserving of adequate health care. But we have a situation where the state says they can't afford it. And so you get little groups, and they, they say, oh, yes, we, we think you should be funded also. But if there's not enough funds, our group needs it more. You get them to argue that way, and it makes it easy for a budget cutter who says, well, we're going to equalize the suffering. We'll spread the suffering out so no one has to suffer more than anyone else. In other words... Every group is going to have people who die. Now, that's a Hobbesian world. Now, how do we intervene in that? Well, is Hobbes right about human nature? Is something that benefits Elizabeth, does it have to be at the expense of Aaron? Or vice versa? So that they have to fight each other over for a bigger piece of a shrinking pie? Because that's what happens in budget cuts. That's what happens in the, the collapse of economies. People are pitted against each other. So you're given two bad decisions. Do we cut this or cut that? Or cut both? Now, there's one saying in the Talmud which is pretty interesting on this. When, when confronted with two bad choices, always take the third. That is, look for another choice. Instead of fighting over a shrinking pie, why don't we just make a bigger pie? So the general interest, the, the common interest, the general welfare, means we have to figure out how to increase the pie. When it comes to budget cutting, we have to figure out how to increase the revenue so that you don't have to fight over a shrinking pie. Now, this is what Lynn is talking about when he's talking about the land bridge. Why would a particular oil company why should they have more rights to an uncovered oil field than anyone else? What if that oil field is in a poverty-stricken nation? 
but that you could use the development of that oil resource to build around it transportation, energy plants that possibly could help with desalination. So if it's in Central Asia, one of the problems in Central Asia is a lack of water. They have some water around, but it's not very good quality. So what if you take the resource and use the resource, selling the resource to benefit the nation? Well, according to Kissinger, if you do that, you're taking away from the resource that's needed by the United States or, or Western Europe. Therefore, you have to conquer that country. They're not entitled to it. In fact, they should reduce their damn population. That's the Hobbesian view. If we can force them to accept the lower living standards so we can get more, what's wrong with that? Now, whether you know it or not, that's the mentality that's driving the chicken hawks, the ones who want this war. They're saying that we're entitled. Why? Because we're better. What's the proof? Well, we're an advanced nation, and those countries are poor. Therefore, God has shined his light on us, and through the bounty of nature, we're better. That's just natural order of things. And they use that to justify the destruction of Africa. Because what do they say? Well, those black people, they're just savages, don't you know? If we weren't down there helping them, they'd probably all eat each other. So we're helping them. We're going in, we're giving them guns. So they can protect themselves. Of course, we're giving their enemies guns also. You know, if you look at colonialism, it starts with this idea of the Hobbesian jungle. And because the Europeans were the colonial powers in the 16th and 17th and 18th century, the colonial policy was a racist policy against black Africans. Of course, if you go back a few hundred years, you find out that within Africa, you had some sections of Africans killing off other sections for the same things, for the raw materials, the land, the water, and so on. Now, does that mean that's the nature of man? No, that's the nature of man when man is primitive. When man thinks like Henry Kissinger, you want, what we should do is, in, in the anthropology books, you know, we should have uh, uh, Homo sapiens. You have different, you know, uh, different levels of so-called human evolution, and the very bottom should be a picture of Kissinger and Brzezinski naked. <laughs> the real primitive development of man. Picture of Brzezinski and Kissinger, you know, each with a, a club trying to hit the other one. <laughs> Because they're the guys behind the clash of civilizations. It's Hobbesian. So Lynn said, instead, you build these programs, these development policies, where nations work together to build each other. Now, what stands in the way, and this is again his speech in Berlin, from stopping war and depression? We well, said the problem is that you've got a systemic crisis. And he said a systemic crisis is based on the same principle as tragedy. Tragedy in classical art. Now, this is where you begin to see the difference between Lynn and any standard politician. Because Lynn will always start with a principle, but a principle which actually is based on the highest potential thinking, the highest quality of thinking of which man is capable. Whereas a politician will find out, what do the people want? You know, if the people want gigantic cheeseburgers and World Wrestling Federation 24 hours a day, you promise them that and you get elected. That you go with the lowest common denominator. You assume that human beings exist on a lower level. And of course, in the case of Brzezinski and Kissinger, they're probably assuming that that most human beings at best rise to their level. And since they think of man as an animal, how could they be much better? So this idea of escape from the Hobbesian clash of civilizations, we have a program that can do it. LaRouche's Land Bridge, the New Bretton Woods, the monetary reform, which basically puts the IMF, the World Bank, the Federal Reserve System in the financial bankruptcy reorganization. And when we say bankruptcy reorganization, let's be clear on one thing. We're not doing that to save those institutions. If you could get rid of those institutions tomorrow without causing more 
chaos, we'd get rid of them. The problem is that if you take a step such as that so dramatically, with the weak, fragile situation of the banks, you'd collapse the whole banking system overnight, and then it would be more difficult to generate new credit. So Lynn's idea is you take these institutions and put them through financial bankruptcy reorganization. What you basically do is you figure out, you take a bank, you figure out how much of the assets of this bank are real, how much are phony, you separate them out, and basically what you'd find is it would look something like this, the diagrams John Hopeful has done. Here are the real, this is the real equity of the bank. Here's its real assets. And here's its debts, its uncollectible debts. This is not a diagram of uh, uh, deaths uh, quadrupling the, the uh, square. It's the way banks exist. Most of them are holding paper that's worthless. So what you do is you take this little bit here and you say, okay, we need this for the real economy. And some of this is probably real also. But this we're going to put in a deep freezer just because we don't want the whole thing to collapse right now, so we can use what's really there to generate credit to private companies so they can start building things, whether it's building new hospitals, new roads, railroads, or so on. And then sometime in the future, we'll defrost the refrigerator. And all the people who had invested money in these speculative instru instruments will say, gee, we defrosted it and they all disappeared. So you, you really do have nothing. That's what a financial bankruptcy reorganization is of a bank. Like the IMF. What does the IMF really have? It's got some gold that it's holding for countries. Meanwhile, it's the conduit by which money is loaned to a country, but it never goes to the country. It goes straight to the IMF, and then they pay off the banks that are owed the money. So the IMF, you could pretty much just dissolve in a, a very short period of time, as the Argentine foreign minister suggested the other day. He said, let's just dissolve the International Monetary Fund. But financial bankruptcy reorganization will work. The Roosevelt-style super TVA will work. You know how we know it'll work? Because it's been done. This is not a theoretical question. This is something you've got to get through to people when you organize them. You know, they say, well, that'll build up too much government. And you say, You're damn right it will. The kind of government that got us out of the last depression and enabled us to win World War II and rebuild most of the world during the 50s and 60s. What's wrong with that? Look where your little government, your attacks on government have gotten us. Into a global depression where we're killing off Africa. We're now starting to Africanize Latin America. Which do you want? You want what we did after World War II to rebuild? Or what you've done the last 30 years with deregulation to destroy? This isn't a theoretical question. We're not debating with Adam Smith whether there's something good in Adam Smith's theory. Uh, Robert and I had dinner with someone last night who said, well, you can't throw out everything in Adam Smith. You know, he didn't lie about everything. Well, you know, presumably he'd get up some morning, look out and say, it looks like a nice day and it might be a nice day. So perhaps occasionally... You could trust him, although if he said, don't bring your umbrella, I wouldn't have listened to him. Everything he wrote on economic theory was designed to promote the British Empire. It, his whole Adam Smith was a Hobbesian. Any of you study economics in, in college? Ed? What do most of you study? Ceramics, uh, <laughs> massage, I know, acting and film, right? How many of you studied some program to get you into the acting business? Uh, now, now you're all just intimidated. What, what were you, poli-sci majors? Sociology majors? Anthropology? Any anthropologists here? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Did you write any? <laughs> well, I've, I've met with economists and I've gone through the curriculum. Adam Smith is what they teach. Adam Smith is credited with being the father of free trade. But as in the case of most of these British guys, he stole it from a Venetian. It was the Venetians who proposed free trade. Free trade always means it's free for me. 
we're going to not allow you to protect your economy so that you'll never develop industry, you'll never develop roads, we'll come down and we'll give you a little bit, but you're going to have to buy our goods. And you're going to have to buy them with your cheap labor. And if someone says, well, can't we charge more for industry? Oh, no, that's, that's unfair competition. So free trade has always been a policy of an empire oppressing the people in the colonies. Our founding fathers knew that. Washington knew it. Franklin knew it. Hamilton knew it. Abe Lincoln knew it. William F. McKinley knew it. Franklin Roosevelt knew it. John Kennedy knew it. But starting 1968, everyone in this country went brain dead. We started being taught Adam Smith was the founder of American economic system. So this is what Lynn means when he says tragedy. The basis of the flawed policy, the reason people would not would go with Hobbes rather than with LaRouche, is because they don't know what they're doing. And they've become accustomed to thinking in the kind of sloppy way that would allow them to accept something which is a lie. You have this guy, Phil Graham, and a group of his friends, actually after the 1994 congressional elections where the Democrats were routed and the Republicans took the House and the Senate, they wore these ties, there were all these power red ties, and it said Adam Smith, Adam Smith, Adam Smith, all along their tie. And they proudly paraded around in the Capitol with these ties. Then they went to the American Enterprise Institute dinner and talked about how they had transformed American politics around this idea of free trade, which you know, by free trade we're talking about things like NAFTA, the World Trade Organization, which was GATT at one time, and so on. Free trade has failed. Free trade is destroying Mexico, the United States, and Canada. You got the trifecta. The three countries involved in NAFTA, all of them have a worse economy since it's been implemented. So what do they say? Well, the problem is we don't have enough free trade yet. Probably because there's still a few people alive in Mexico. So you get back to Hobbes and the clash of civilizations. They promote this policy. Adam Smith has the view of man that's an animal. What drives man? The seeking of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. That's the fundamental motive force behind what you choose to do. Now, if that's true, then we are all animals. If that's how we approach life, we only want those things that give us immediate pleasure, sensual pleasure, what makes us feel good. And we don't do things that might be hard or cause pain, like work hard. God forbid anyone should have to do hard work. If it's so hard to learn, why should we learn it? Why don't we just learn things that are practical, that we can use? That's how you have a nation transformed into people who are barely competent to use cash registers at McDonald's. Instead of having people who are nuclear scientists and aerospace engineers, you have people who write training manuals for illiterate people on how to run a cash register. So this comes from the idea of, of man as an animal. And the strongest animal can impose their way on others. So in a systemic crisis, what you have is the inability of a nation to reproduce the, the productive wealth that's necessary for the population to survive. Now, right now, for you guys to have a decent standard of living, we're taking food off the plates of people in Africa, off the plates of people in Latin America. There's now starvation in Argentina, which is one of the most wealthy agricultural countries just 10 years ago in the world. Somalia, which could be a breadbasket for all of Africa, there's starvation. Sub-Saharan Africa, there's starvation in areas that have some of the best land in Africa and plenty of water. And instead, you have large numbers of children who are orphans whose parents have died of, of AIDS. The children are sick. There's no medicine. There's no fresh water. There's no health care. There's no transportation to get them to hospitals. There's no food, so the nutritional level has dropped. 
And if you want to breed new diseases, what you do is you allow the nutritional level to drop, especially among children, so that instead of eating in such a way as to grow, including to grow mentally, you basically turn them into a petri dish where diseases get stronger. And if you, you reduce human beings that way, pretty soon the Hobbesian view takes over and the diseases become more strong than man. And children die in large numbers very quickly in these so-called refugee camps, which really become dying fields for orphans in Africa. And now we're seeing the Africanization of Argentina, Brazil. You know, this guy Lula, who ran for president and was elected president of Brazil, had a radical program. He said, look, we've got enough wealth in this country. Why can't we have a program where every child is guaranteed three meals a day? And after he said it, he was reprimanded by the current president, Cardoso, who said, you shouldn't say things like that because people will think there's starvation in Brazil. And then publicly, Cardoso said, we don't have enough money to give every child in Brazil three meals a day. So you can't do that. So that means that there's about one-fourth of the children in Brazil who are lucky if they get one meal a day. Brazil, not the poorest country in the world. And so Lula is caught. Lula ran as a campaign against NAFTA, against the World Trade Organization, against free trade, against privatization. Now he's the president, and he's appointing people who support all of these things. Because the bankers are saying to him, if you go against all this, we'll cut you off. So he's in a bind. And meanwhile, what is, what's coming out in the press? Well, there was one newsletter, James Dale Davidson's Investor's Advisor, whatever it's called. And in it, he said, we'd better watch out for Lula because he might appoint Lyndon LaRouche, the finance minister of Brazil. Now, we haven't had much pleasant to say about Lula because up to now he's been a, a gadfly opportunist. We'd like to see him succeed. We'd like to see Lula and a new president of Argentina link up with Mexico and say to the International Monetary Fund, you're through. But up to this present moment, it looks as though Lula is going to follow the straight and narrow path of the IMF to the death of Brazil. So this is the Hobbesian world we're in. So how do you change it? And this is where Lynn brought up this question of tragedy and sublime. The essence of tragedy in classical drama is when a population has been corrupted to the point where the people themselves put the shackles on where the people enslave themselves. And they enslave themselves by the axioms of their time, that is, the beliefs that everyone has. Today, I mean, what do most Americans think? If you talk to someone about a depression, someone who, who's, who doesn't think you're, you're selling Prozac or something, you know, you go up to people now and you say there's a depression, and they say, oh no, I took my Prozac today. <laughs> You know, so we got a society that's, that's got some problems with these things. But if you talk to someone, you say, look, the banks could collapse. Oh, no, the banks will never collapse. Why not? Oh, they will never let it happen. Who's they? The brilliant geniuses who brought us Enron and Conseco? They will never let it happen? Well, what's happening now? Why are all these things happening? Well, there are built-in stabilizers. You ever hear that term? Any of you? No? What's a built-in stabilizer? It's something that now exists in the fantasy world of people who don't want to face the fact that every built-in stabilizer that was put in as the anti-depression policy of Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s has been abolished. Banking regulation was there to protect against the kind of looting that's going on. They got rid of it. The last bit of banking, or banking regulation was deregulated four years ago. Look what deregulation did to California. Now, is there anyone here who thinks it would be legitimate to argue that deregulation would be a good thing for California electricity? How many people here are still for deregulation of California electricity? All right, for the record, there are no hands going up. If this were the state legislature, every one of you would have raised your hand. Or most of you would have. And then if you were meeting with a legislator, you could say, I, I talked to a guy today, an aide to a, a senator, who's 
who last year was on the Energy Committee. And I said to him, he wanted to know about the Super TVA, and we were talking about that for a couple minutes, but I realized he could read this in a pamphlet. That's not what we needed to discuss. So I said, let me ask you something. Does your boss have the courage to stand up and admit that we have a budget crisis in California because everyone in the legislature made a mistake? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, they all supported deregulation. And that was the trigger that caused California to have the biggest budget deficit in the history of a state in this country. $24 billion last year, maybe $30 billion or more this year. I said, does she have the courage to stand up and say she made a mistake? And there was silence. And I said, well, what about it? Well, she voted for deregulation. I said, I know. But would she say it was a mistake? Silence. Why? Well, partly because the governor and everyone else is still saying we've got to give deregulation a chance. Okay, well, why are we attacking Trent Lott? Why don't we give segregation a chance again? Why don't we give the plague a chance? Why don't we give nuclear war a chance? I mean, you've got something that has been destructive. It didn't work. It wasn't supposed to work. And they're clinging to it. Because they were brought up in the post-67 era where everyone was told that government is bad. Franklin Roosevelt was a socialist. And you got some people even say his real name was Franklin Rosenfeld and he was a Jewish socialist. <laughs> I mean, if you really delve into the anti-FDR stuff, you find that it's completely crazy. But this is what you find out there. So they believe these things. And so this is called an axiom. People die because of their axioms. The Jews in Germany had an axiom, which is Germany is a civilized country. Even if Hitler comes to power, he'll never do anything against the Jews. That axiom led to their deaths. Many of you have axioms like that. We ran into axioms when we put forward the AIDS initiative in California. We said that AIDS is going to be a big killer and that people should be tested universally so everyone who has it should know about it as soon as possible. And the axiom, especially among a certain grouping in the gay community, was, well, if you test people for AIDS, the next thing you're going to do is lock them all up in concentration camps. That wasn't in our initiative. Our initiative said, if we find someone who has AIDS, you give them the best treatment immediately. And you make sure they're not spreading the disease. That's public health. You know, if, if tuberculosis would have been a disease of, of left-handed uh, Samoans, <laughs> would there have been a, a movement against testing for tuberculosis? Had our referenda passed, the, the, we had two referenda on the ballots, one I think in 85 or 86 and the other in 87. And you know who came out and defeated it? Primarily a group, well, a couple of groups. One, at that time, I think Patty Duke was the chairman of the Screen Actors Guild. She led demonstrations against LaRouche <laughs> in an alliance with a group in San Francisco called Dykes on Bikes. <laughs> And they went out marching in San Francisco with signs that said, Douche LaRouche. <laughs> and what were they were defending? They were defending a disease. Because our referendum never said, lock up gay people, being gay is evil. What we said is letting people die of AIDS because you don't have the money to spend for it is evil. It's genocide. And we can say without being defensive that there are a lot of people who are now dead, who would have lived had there been a reasonable, rational debate instead of an attack on LaRouche on this question. That's the tragedy when you see how axioms turn people crazy. So they actually act against their general welfare. You see the same thing with the whole question of the health care. People thought, hey, maybe we can make money on health care. Why should the government pay for health care? 
you know, up until 1973, we had a bill that meant that if anybody got sick, if you were poor, if you had no insurance, you could be given treatment, the best possible treatment. It's called the Hill-Burton Act. But it got in the way of a bunch of Hobbesians making money off people being sick. And so they got rid of the thing and they set up HMOs, which we called appropriately uh, Hitler mur murder organizations. Because <laughs> basically an HMO says, well, we're going to make your medical care cheaper by having a kind of insurance with this uh, health maintenance organization. And it's really great because it doesn't cost much. Of course, if you get sick, you'll probably die. But the stockholders will make a lot of money. Now, the fraud in this is not only have HMOs killed a lot of people, but they're all going bankrupt now. They're not making money because when an economy declines, when you start having a spiraling deceleration of an economy, even people can't afford HMOs anymore. The HMOs can't afford any kind of medical procedure. You go in with your arm whacked off into an emergency room. You don't have health care at the HMO. They say, it doesn't look that bad to me. <laughs> Take a couple aspirin and call us in a week. Or they send you to a, a sweatshop tailor and say, let them put your arm back on. And the HMOs will pay them a few cents on the dollar. You, I'm, I'm trying deliberately to show you the axioms you have will kill you. You saw it at those hearings. People who were in wheelchairs, they're going to be cut, whether they're in wheelchairs for MS or just uh, paraplegics and quadriplegics whose health center is going to be shut down, Ranchos Los Amigos. Who's fighting for them? Who's fighting for the poor children, the crack babies? Who's fighting for children whose parents are, are split up and the, the mother's unemployed, the father's disappeared? Who's fighting for them? If they can get people to fight for their narrow interest group, everybody loses. And they create a Hobbesian jungle. This is the tragedy. This is the principle of tragedy. Now, partly because everybody's living this, it's hard for them to see it. You know, if you're on the stage in a tragedy, think about a, a tragic hero. Think about, we'll take Don Carlos. I don't know how many of you have read Don Carlos. It's a beautiful play. And your, your hero, the, the, hero, the two heroes in it, Don Carlos and the Marquis of Poza, they have a lot of good ideas. But they have their problems, which cause them to fail to see that they're, going to, they're walking down the path to a tragic outcome. Don Carlos is so consumed with anger for his father because his father was one of the biggest scumbags in history, Philip II of Spain, the Habsburg Emperor. And Philip II of Spain is about to launch armies into the Netherlands to slaughter the Protestants who lived there in the name of Christianity. I mean, what is a religious war anyway? We are... Catholics and we love God so we love God so much we're going to kill all the Protestants this was in, in 1520s through 1560s the revolt of the Netherlands which took place in the 1560s and so Don Carlos is trying to figure out how to get his father not to do that because Don Carlos was the grandson of Charles V who was from the Netherlands and so he's trying to figure out how to talk to his father. Meanwhile, his father, Philip II, had arranged for Don Carlos, his, the future king and his son, to marry Princess Elizabeth of France. But before that can happen, Philip II's wife dies. So he marries Elizabeth. So Don Carlos' future wife ended up being his stepmother. Now, Don Carlos, who's not a bad guy, he's a good guy, he wants to do what's right, is so enraged at his father that instead of talking to his father about how stupid it is to go to war, instead is consumed by vengeance because his father took his, his fiance. And so his friend, the Marquis of Poza, comes riding into town. The Marquis of Poza is modeled on, in some ways, the, ideas of, the ideals of the American Revolution. Because a lot of what Schiller wrote 
was about the, the principles of the American Revolution, which he loved and he wanted to bring to Europe. So the Marquis of Posa comes in with a plan. He's going to get together with Don Carlos and Elizabeth and convince Philip not to go to war. And so he rides up and he sees Don Carlos and he says, okay, here's my plan. And Don Carlos says, I'm so enraged. I want to kill my father. And it suddenly occurs to the Marquis of Posa that it's not too likely that a guy in that state is going to successfully organize his father. You know, if you want to kill somebody, it's not too likely you're going to be able to organize them, as you can tell us. <laughs> so what happens? Well, instead of saying, all right, let's figure this thing out. We can't do anything if you're insane, Don Carlos, so you've got to drop this obsession with your stepmother. Instead, Posa tries to, to manipulate. Posa goes in and has this beautiful dialogue with the king and sometime soon Robert this is something we should do as, as another scene at some point the scene of the king and Posa where Posa is laying out the most beautiful ideas and he starts to get to the king he starts to reach the king and the problem is the king wants him to work for him when the king really needs a friend the king's got a big problem behind the king the most powerful king in Christianity is the Inquisition. So the king himself is a puppet. And if Don Carlos realized that, he could have said to his father, you're a puppet of the Inquisition which is going to destroy you. Instead, as the thing plays out, Posa says to the king, be a king of a thousand kings. Treat your subjects well so they love you. He basically gives a speech about the general welfare and the king says this makes a lot of sense. Then he says, so I want you to work for me. Now, the Marquis of Posa had just given a big spiel about how he'll never work for a king. And in the end, he shakes his hand and says, okay, I'll work for you. He goes in and sees Elizabeth and says to Elizabeth, I convinced the king. Just like some of you say, I found the greatest contact ever. He's going to join in a week. And then you find out they gave you the wrong number. And Elizabeth sees the Marquis of Posa and says, my husband? You convinced my husband? What are you, nuts? And the tragedy unfolds because, in a, in almost in the complex domain. Because again, you're talking about relationships within relationships. Elizabeth's trying to move the king, but the king is suspicious of Elizabeth. Don Carlos is trying to get revenge against his father at the same time he's trying to appeal to Elizabeth. The Marquis of Posa is trapped in his own game. And he's what Schiller calls a schwärmer. He's so in love with this, his ideas, his morality, that he can't recognize that underneath it he's about to lose everything. So it's a beautiful play, but what's the tragedy? There's not a single person in there who realized what was really going on. They were all in their own minds. And so as it unfolds, Posa is killed. He takes a bullet for Don Carlos. You see that Don Carlos is not going to succeed. He, as he's about, he becomes a sublime figure at the end, and I'll get to that in a moment, where he figures it out, and then he realizes, well, in spite of everything, I have to do what's right. But it's too late. And Philip is left in a situation where he has to kill his own son to save his reign. And therefore permanently estrange his wife who's the true beautiful figure in this the Queen Elizabeth and at the very end when Philip should be triumphant what does he do? He sends the troops to go in and pillage and kill in the Netherlands and then he sits down with the Grand Inquisitor the head of the, the Inquisition and the Grand Inquisitor says you fool and you see that Philip has no power over anything. He's controlled by this oligarchical institution called the Inquisition. And you go to a play like this, and what do you see? If it's done properly, if it's acted properly, you see yourself. You see the compromises you make. If you are seeing the Marquis of Posa in yourself, you're seeing elements of that, how you have this sense that you can do all these great things and you don't even realize you're impotent. You're, you're fooled by yourself. 
if you're Don Carlos, you realize, is that me? Consumed by rage so I can't be effective? And you watch this and you see a picture of history. A, a psychological history. Now, Schiller, in this play, diverges from reality. The real history of Don Carlos is somewhat shrouded in mystery. Supposedly, he was an epileptic and someone who couldn't control his eating. And his family supposedly had to lock him up for his own protection. And he died very young in, in uh, jail. Now, we don't really know that that's true. I, I tend to think Schiller's right that it's not true. Because Schiller was reading the Venetian ambassador's letters back to Venice. And this is the real history. The Venetian ambassador was saying, we fear what Don Carlos might do. Now, if the guy's a basket case epileptic, why would the Venetians be afraid of him? And so they may have been telling the king, look, your son's a, a, a nutcase. You've got to lock him up. We don't know what really happened with Don Carlos, but the play gives you a higher level insight. This is a case where the dramatic, the psychological dramatic effect of the way Schiller portrays Don Carlos actually shows you why there was no effective opposition in Spain at that time. <coughs> now, where does the sublime get in? Well, in, in a tragedy such as Don Carlos, even though at the end you see that Don Carlos realized that, that he had been manipulated and that he was not going to be effective, he still made the decision, even though it will mean my life, I'm going to go and go to the low countries and warn them that the troops are coming and prepare them to fight. And he was captured at that moment, so he never got to leave. But he had decided that the mission of trying to stop this war was more important than getting his stepmother as his wife, was more important than curing the problems he was having with his father, that what was important was stopping a religious war. It was too late. But this principle of sublime is this idea when the mission is what moves you to the point that you cannot allow yourself to be stopped by anything, including the fear of your own physical death. And that's why Lynn has recently been talking on the question of the sublime about one of the most important characters in history, Joan of Arc. Jeanne d'Arc, a young woman, 14 years old, 13 years old, Here's a voice that she has to save France. France is in terrible shape. They've got a king who makes Bush look like a towering intellect and a, a, a person of great moral virtue. A cowardly king who's afraid to take on the British. He's afraid to take on his own, the people in his own court who are uh, conspiring against him. And this young woman who hears voices that tell her, you will save France. You are the the, the future of France. And she decides to follow those voices. And in Schiller's play, then again, Schiller's play is different from the actual story in a couple of ways. But it actually shows dramatically and psychologically what it means to become a sublime person, to overcome fear, and why the play of uh, the Virgin of Orleans is not a tragedy. Because what happens is Joan goes to the king and convinces the king, or the Dauphin, the prince, that he should become the king and he should fight for France. And there's all this court intrigue going on, but she ends up in charge of the army and she goes out and starts defeating the British, rallying the people of France, and eventually getting to the point where people are telling the king, you better watch out, she's going to usurp you. You're going to lose your power. And there's a lot in the play that... that is interesting, but there's one moment in the play where Schiller shows you the vulnerability of someone who is taken on a mission, but not fully, because Joan is still conflicted. She's not quite sure what she should do. Should she keep going? Is she doing the wrong thing? Is she acting too much like a man? Will people continue to listen to her? What if she loses? There are these doubts. And then the, the biggest doubt of all, she momentarily thinks she's falling in love with the man. Now, is Schiller saying that a woman who has a mission should be a nun? 
No, of course not. But in the middle of warfare, when you're the one person who's the, who can save a nation, should you start having and indulging in sexual fantasies? You win the war, then do it. No, that's, you should never indulge in sexual fantasies. <laughs> Unless you're a script writer. So, Joan of Arc has this moment where she thinks she's falling in love and she has to, at that point, in the Schiller play, she concludes that she's not worthy. And she goes through a series of trials, including being rejected by her father, who's a man of the people. What does her father say? You're just an ignorant woman. Girl, you can't lead France. Get back to our house. Get married. Have a family. Be normal. You're disgracing the family. Here's a young woman who's led France to victories against England, and the father's angry at her. You're hurting our family name. The neighbors are whispering about you. Aren't you still a girl? Look at you in that armor, and so on. And so after going through this crisis, and then getting locked up by the British... Joan triumphs at the end of this play. She rises directly into the heaven, the heavens. Now, in reality, what happened to Joan of Arc? Well, she was captured by the British. She was betrayed by the French. She was put before the Inquisition. And they said, if you wish to survive, just admit that you're a witch admit that this was some incantation, some fraud. And you can actually read, because they, they took this down, you can get the, a book on the interrogation of Joan of Arc. It's really interesting. Cause you, and, and by the way, they just made a, a movie called The Messenger to show you how corrupt and despicable modern Hollywood is. They play Joan of Arc as sort of a rebellious Gen Xer. And in the, in the end... Dustin Hoffman, basically, the, what she thought was the voice of God, turns out to be Dustin Hoffman, who's basically the devil, <laughs> who's manipulating her behind the scenes. I mean, it's a horrible, horrible movie. Uh, um, maybe. But what happened to Joan is, is really quite incredible. She stood up to the Inquisition. She did not capitulate. She never agreed and in the end, she was burned. She was killed. Maybe she was 17 years old, 18 years old. Yeah? She makes she make some sort of vacillation in real life? There, was a, there, there were, supposedly, she was thinking about a plea bargain. Now, look, she would have been killed anyway. But she held firm. And if you read the, the transcripts, you'll see she never capitulated. And what did that do? That inspired the people of France. And in the background, in that court, was a very young man by the name of Louis, who watched this thing play out. He eventually became King Louis XI. And inspired by Joan, when he became king, he established the first modern nation state with the idea being that for France to be strong, he should not just be a king who treats people like human cattle, but he should develop an educational system to uplift every single one of the citizens of France. And so Joan of Arc, who you might say died a horrible death, Schiller ends his play by saying, grief is the pain, the pain of the fire the joy shall be eternal. That through her death, her sacrifice, her mission, France became the first modern nation state. Now, what would baby boomer parents say to a child who wanted to do that? Well, who cares if France is going to be a nation state 200 years from now? That's not going to pay your bills. That's not going to pay off your credit card. Do you think your mom and I are going to work all of our lives to pay off your college debt? 
don't give me this bullshit about voices telling you to save the nation. I want to know, is LaRouche going to pay for your dental work? <laughs> now, the sublime person, the sublime person is the person who looks in the face of that and says, well, why am I living? What am I living for? What is the purpose of life? Now, if you're a Hobbesian, what is the purpose of life? To figure out how to get one up on your neighbor. To figure out how to get the promotion at work. How to cheat people. To get more in your, your banking account. To, to accept deregulation, even if it means you're going to be screwing the country. To support NAFTA, even if you know it means children in Mexico will lose the food that will end up on your table because you can pay more for it than poor people in Mexico. And then you say, well, you know, sure, I'm living well over them, but what am I supposed to do? I can't do anything about it. They're too strong. And then you say to them, if you allow this to happen, your moral degeneration will be the degeneration of the nation. I'm just taking care of myself. They're too strong. You can't beat them. Well, Joan of Arc, fortunately, didn't listen to her father, to her sisters, to people in her village. She didn't listen to the lying uh, weasels around the king who said, look, you know, give her some money and send her home. You can't win this fight. The Dauphin himself, he got crowned king because of Joan, and then he betrayed her. She didn't listen to that. She had a mission, a mission where she thought, it's up to me to save France. And she did it. And to this day, she is the inspiration of the nation of France. She may have had her physical death on a pile of wood in a courtyard outside of Paris. But she is more alive today than the professors at the Sorbonne who were teaching Descartes to torture their students. Now, that's what Lynn means turning tragedy into the sublime. That you never allow yourself to be captured and, and, and chained by your axioms. Even if everybody agrees, everybody in this room agrees, we have to have budget cuts. So let's get together and work out the budget cuts. Then we can all go out and celebrate. And you say to someone, well, you're going to cut the budget today. What's going to happen next year? Oh, the recovery will come. You still believe in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy? Don't you know about LaRouche's forecasts? He's been right. We can show you that there's not going to be a recovery. Well, but we have to cut the budget. We're going to do it. We're going to limit the pain. And on and on and on. Now, this is where the individual, this is where each of you can be a Joan of Arc. When Lynn spoke before a last cadre school, you remember what he said? He said, your generation has an opportunity to transform mankind, to create a new mankind. What do you mean by that? Well, the problem that most people have with what I'm saying, is they say, well, I could see, you know, I'm a good person. Maybe I will sacrifice, but nobody else will. And eventually, I'll be left all alone, a broken person who gave up a life because of my ideals. And so, therefore, I'm just going to be like everyone else. I'll be good. I'll try and vote for good people. I won't steal from the poor. I'll give money to charity. If I have any money, and so on and, and so forth. And that's how people get shrunken. That's what we mean by tragedy. When people drop their ideals because it's difficult to live up to the ideals. It's the same thing when you work on something. When you read a Schiller play, it's not that easy. You have to work on these ideas. You have to get into the mind of Schiller. It's, it's somewhat easier with Shakespeare because Shakespeare writes in English, although it's not the English that most of you know. But you get inside a character in a Shakespeare play. And what do you find? You're actually getting into the mind of Shakespeare. Shakespeare is acting on your imagination. 
The stage in the theater is not up in front of you. It's in your own mind. And you're working through for yourself the question of, can I fight? Can I step above my society, outside of my century, and act for mankind? And great classical drama, just like great classical music, strengthens your ability to do that. Similarly with the, the work, work on Gauss. It's not easy. In fact, it's very difficult. But once you start thinking in the complex domain, once you start acknowledging that everything I've been taught on this is wrong, that if we're going to study mathematics, you actually have to realize that the, the foundation of mathematics is a fraud. Number. Where does number come from? And Sky and others have been working on this regularly, and I, I think a lot of you have been working on this. Well, numbers are derived from something that actually occurs in the physical universe. There's really no such thing as a one just existing by itself out there. And you might say, well, what about one glass? Isn't this a one? Why? You have to start looking at the universe differently. So you work on hard questions. The, the, maybe just one or two or three or four people in all of history came up with an idea that's a scientific breakthrough. Well, suppose a whole generation masters those principles of discovery. And what you're mastering is not the one specific breakthrough. And I'll talk about this on Saturday, the question of hypothesis. Because the way a society changes is not just when you learn what was the best hypothesis that the best thinkers had. But you actually learn that for every hypothesis, and then under the hypothesis, once a, a universal physical principle is discovered and you've proven it and you've worked it through and you have a theorem, lat a lattice work that, that has all the theorems and axioms, all of a sudden an inconvenience occurs. You discover there's something real in the physical universe that's not answered by what you know. And you need a new hypothesis, a superseding hypothesis. And it's in the process of developing the new hypothesis that you get closer to truth. But then, is the truth in that new hypothesis? Well, you may discover that that new hypothesis has within it similar axiomatic flaws. So what is it that you're really looking for? You're looking for the means by which new hypotheses are developed. Not just mastering what the current knowledge is. What do we know about things? But how did people come to know it throughout history? That's why this idea of studying what Greek geometry was, Greek astronomy, then picking it up again with Cusa, with Leonardo, with the work of Leiden Kepler and then Leibniz, that you're seeing the dialogue that goes on through the centuries of the greatest thinkers to solve the most important questions of how the physical universe works. And then your mind is trained so that you're thinking not about how to solve a specific problem, but how to solve the problems that we don't even foresee yet. Because you're training yourself in the method of hypothesis. And so you realize that what makes you a human being is that you have that capacity. That all human beings have that capacity. I don't care if you're black, brown, white, pink, all human beings, by virtue of being human, have the capacity for that kind of thinking. But we also have the capacity to act like animals. If our society says, Hobbes is right, we're really driven primarily by taking care of our needs. We have to eat, drink, sleep, and procreate. And of course, if you've grown up since the 1960s, the most important is procreation. We've created a sex cult in our society. I mean, I had a, the weirdest thing on, on my plane coming out here was the penthouse pet of the year in the, in the first class section. I had an upgrade. I'm sitting in there. And there's this guy starting to hand out this, this sheet which says, meet so-and-so, the penthouse pet of the year. And he, he was looking for people who he thought might be connected with Hollywood, I think, because I think she's coming out here to get a job. And he's passing this thing out like she's a, a, 
a freak show at a circus. And to tell you the truth, what she looked like is she was smuggling silicone in her brassiere. <laughs> now, most of the guys in the plane in the first class section, and this was a 777, so there's no bathroom in the very front. And people if I know that you have to go in between the first class and the coach to get to a bathroom. They were all pretending they were going up to a bathroom in the front so they could then turn around and watch her as they were quietly walking back to their seats. It was an unbelievable spectacle. A bunch of Hobbesian people with too much time and money on their hands watching a display of modern medicine. <laughs> now, or I should say modern sculptor. <laughs> the greatest sculptors are the people who get rid of double chins and tummy tucks and things of that sort. Pneumatics. Pneumatics. <laughs> so, Ed keeps abreast of these things. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have a, a civilization where are we human beings or are we animals? If Hobbes is right, then we're going to have to go to war against Iraq, and then we'll go to war against Iran, Syria. Lebanon, Libya, Saudi Arabia, and we finished off the Arab countries, the next target is China. That's how they think. And they think because we have super weapons, we can beat them all. They're not concerned with peace. They're not concerned with helping the situation for the people of Iraq. If they were, they wouldn't have been starving Iraq of food and medicine for the last 10 years. But if you reject Hobbes, if you understand this principle of all human beings created in the image of God, and that our job is to use the method of paradox through dialogue, through discussion, exchange of ideas, to show people that they're human, that they're not animals. As people discover that, they begin to get excited about the fact that every other human mind is a potential for them to expand their own knowledge. That through Socratic dialogue, you come to know more about the world, more about other people, and ultimately more about yourself. And if you engage in this around the world, as, as Lynn was saying in Berlin, you have a dialogue of cultures. The way Lynn put it on this is that... Uh, we need a dialogue between different language cultures. You need it at the governmental level, that is to make sure you can have trade policies and cooperation policies instead of war, but he said also it must include the people in the dialogue. That there must be a Socratic discussion of the common aims of mankind. And if you have a nation that does that deliberately, that instead of saying, as most Americans do, we are number one. We are number one. The, the, the kind of arrogant nationalism that's called patriotism. You know, you get a, an image of people like sports fans with that foam rubber finger, you know, sitting there saying, we are number one when we're bombing Iraq or something like that. Instead of that, this idea that let's see what we can find out about these other nations. Look at their culture. Look at their development. The fact that they had grandparents who sacrificed and worked harder to improve the life for them. The fact that they want their grandchildren to have a better future. Can we do something to help them live a life that will give their grandchildren a better future? Because if we can, they'll be our friends and we can work together in a dialogue of culture. And so this idea of moving from tragedy to the sublime is the principle of the tragedy, the, the tragic figure of Hamlet, the tragic figure of Marquis of Poza and Don Carlos, the tragic figure of uh, Oedipus Rex. And instead, look at in ourselves as, as a Joan of Arc who lives not for our own momentary pleasure, but lives to be a a universal citizen of all time. So that as we know today, Socrates died, he was poisoned, and yet Socrates is in our lives. Those who, who read Plato, especially who read it as a group, 
Socrates is alive in your mind. Shakespeare lives on. Not because his books are here. They tried to kill Shakespeare. As Lynn recently said, having Laurence Olivier be claimed as the, the world's greatest Shakespearean actor is an attempt to re-kill Shakespeare. Instead of having the ideas of Shakespeare in your mind so that your mind becomes the stage. You know, I, I, we had a big debate in the organization a few years ago when Kenneth Branagh did his Henry V. And there were some people who said, well, it's really heroic. It really paints a good picture of Henry. He did it well. From the very first moment of the film, he completely violated the whole film. This is something that, that Robert and I demonstrated at a conference a couple of years ago. There's something called prologue in Henry V. A lone figure in the corner of the stage comes out and tells you that this play is going to take place in your imagination. On this stage, this bare stage, we're going to see horses, the vasty fields of France. And you're looking at a stage and you know from listening to this that the purpose of this play is to put in your mind the sense of how a small group of people rose to the occasion of winning a great war. How does Bronick start? Well, you don't see a small stage. You see a whole bunch of horses. You see the vasty fields of France. There's no effort to capture this principle of classical drama, of the drama taking place in your mind. You don't have to. It's easy. You can sit back smoke your marijuana, eat your popcorn, and he's going to just show you what's going on right in front of you. And in the end, you say, I don't really know what that was about, but he sure was a good actor, wasn't he? That's the conceit of the individual, as opposed to the person who makes themselves, as an actor, a vehicle for the ideas of the author, in a way that you actually appreciate what was said in the play and you appreciate even more the actor because the actor was doing the play not for their own celebrity but for their love of the ideas and that's the problem in our culture if you can reduce a population to hedonistic impulses taking care of themselves feeling good having their own pleasure avoiding pain having things easy, be practical, be popular, dress like everyone else, be like everyone else. I mean, the greatest hoax in the counterculture is we're going to prove our individualism by growing our hair long. Yeah, there was a real proof of individualism, so everyone's walking, all the guys, including myself, walk around with long hair. Great statement. All it proved is that we weren't prematurely bald. But instead, you know, what's going on inside your head? So the fight we have is to take this principle to people of tragedy. What will happen to this world if you continue to behave the way you're doing? And not be angry at the person, but help them see that they're walking down the road to hell, taking the whole society with them. And they think they're just being practical, just making a living just being a good person. And if we can get people to see that the choice is between tragedy if you don't think and don't act as opposed to having a mission that means that 100 or 200 years from now people who may not know your name will nevertheless be grateful that you live. That's the kind of mission that we have to challenge people to. So it's not just a mission about building bridges and roads and, and putting bad guys into bankruptcy. It's a mission that will change the nature of human beings. And I'll just finish with this final point. You know, you talk to people about this and they say, well, I agree with everything you said, except you'll never do it. Why not? Well, people will never be that way. People are inherently greedy. People want to get their own pleasure. They'll never suppress their pleasure for some greater purpose. Now, you could say to them, and this is actually not a bad thing to say, well, I know you're talking about yourself right now, but let's talk about other people. 
Or you could say that what you're looking at is the tragedy. What you just described is a tragedy. Because if we don't change, and you don't want to change just because you're saying it's a negation. Well, if, if you continue like this, things are going to get worse, and you don't want that, so we should do something better. No, it's that you want to point out that you are a prisoner of your culture, a captive of your culture. So you have no freedom. But if you fight, if you fight for the truth and to bring the truth to others, you can achieve a true freedom through making that mission your own, through developing yourself as a fighter for the good. And so people who don't think this can happen are trying to avoid the fight. They are comfortable because they ultimately think things may get worse, but they're never going to get that bad. And clearly that means they don't know what happened with the fall of the Roman Empire. How brutal life was. Why do we call it a dark age? Because people died when they were 12 years old, and that was considered almost mature. If you lived to be 25, you had no teeth. You could barely walk. It was a brutal society. It's what's now existing in parts of Africa, where 25-year-olds are considered senior citizens because of the new diseases, the outbreak of AIDS, and so on. We're moving into a dark age. So you want to fight it? Here's what we can do. And you bring optimism. And what Lynn said is if we get a generation of young people who work on these ideas, work on these principles, who take on a mission and demonstrate to people that having this kind of outlook is not something that makes you unhappy, or sacrificing, but this is what brings you pleasure. To act for all human history brings you a great deal of joy. Brief is the pain, the joy shall be eternal. Then you'll live a life worth living. And when you're 90 years old and your teeth have fallen out and you're sitting around talking to your great-grandchildren, you can say, I was there when we changed history. Obviously, if we win, you'll probably be about 120 before your teeth fall out. <laughs> I was there when we changed history. I acted for the good. I didn't believe in Hobbes. I proved Hobbes wrong. That's what it means to be a human. And so we need a generation that aspires to the sublime rather than wanting to live in the process of, of development. It's something called self-development, where the person who lives that way is not controlled by axioms because they're always looking for axioms. They're always looking for the mistakes they're making. You see, you take a great scientist like Johannes Kepler, and if you read the earlier writings of Kepler on the, the question of the order, the orbit of the planets, Kepler knew he made some mistakes, that he didn't get everything right. And what he kept doing was working on this process of hypothesis. In his last writing, The Harmonies of the World, Kepler starts saying things like, Aha! Look what I found out! How foolish I was to believe this! Because the person who lives in this realm is living for the truth. And so you want to find the flaws. So one of the things Bruce Director did when he was in, in Houston is he took the example of the late quartets of Beethoven. And in music, one of the things you want to do is you want to find anomalies. That is, you want to have intervals of just, it could just be two notes that are part of a transformation. That you find there's something incomplete in it. You have to go somewhere. You have to make a change. And the pathway is somewhat implied, not in the two notes as individual notes, but in what exists, as Furtwangler calls it, between the notes. And so, if you do a simple and I, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but it's a simple classical piece, it's relatively easy to see the anomaly. But what happens when you start getting more complex? All of a sudden you find there are more anomalies, more singularities, more things, paradoxes. You're starting to pull your hair out. Well, actually, you want to increase the density of paradoxes because that's how you learn. That's how you know you're making progress. And so the reason it's not an axiom 
is there, there, there is an axiom here. The axiom is that we always strive to find the truth because we love the truth more than any system. That's the way Schiller put it. And Schiller said the bread scholar, that is the person who lives and works only to eat, loves the system more than the truth. So if you love the system more than the truth, you're going to be trying to keep those axioms imposed. If you love the truth, you live axiomatically for all mankind. And you're not afraid to discover that you might have made a mistake. Kind of the, uh, keeping, kind of the uh, ability to keep moving. Well, kind uh, or... Of kind of... Sure. Uh, kind of uh, walled in by one. Yeah, kind of, absolutely. Keep moving with themselves. It's what Kuzma called the self-subsisting positive. That, that you're, you're looking for answers always, including answers that may show that you were wrong. And if you find out you're wrong, you say, ah, what an idiot. Yeah. How could I have believed that? That's what the great scientists. See, I, I was having a talk with someone the other day who was saying, well, now that I'm learning Gauss and I'm learning Riemann, there's just... The, the, the rate of discoveries are, are slowing down. So, I, And, you know, I said, look, you know why most mathematicians go crazy when they're 25? Because up to the age of 25, they're, they're, they're mastering increasingly complex questions. Then all of a sudden, they get to the point where they think they've answered everything, and they realize that there are whole things out there that they have no idea what they're dealing with, but all they've been doing is learning the formulas, not the method of discovery. And so all of a sudden, they're saying... This is too complex, and they have breakdowns. They go nuts. This happens repeatedly. The most brilliant young mathematical physicists are, are usually insane by the age of 25 or 26. Then they get tenure, and they teach you. <laughs> yeah. So this idea, that's a good point you made, the idea of being willing to... See, you're not afraid of the future. You're not afraid... Okay, I hope no one discovers during my lifetime that I made a mistake. So I've got to make it as obscure as possible so no one can figure it out. And then people say, wow, he's deep. Oh, he's covering up. This is, I mean, Lynn will, you, you watch Lynn, you watch Lynn with scientists. Always poking, playful. That's one of the keys also to creativity. You're playful. You don't take yourself seriously in the sense that you're afraid that, that someone's challenging you. You seek the challenge. You try to provoke people. That's a totally different way of living. So, who, who did I provoke here? Edward? Always. <laughs> uh, I started talking about, uh, in the beginning, you, you were talking about getting people to act in their own best interest. Mm -hmm. um, we always say around here that, that learning happens in the mind of the person making the discovery. Yeah. Out in the field, you, I, I'm dealing with a lot of people who, uh, who I think I can help them, but... You better duck. Well, <laughs> I, I've actually laid off on that reason. I'm trying, I'm trying nice to get Eddie. <laughs> so you guys think there's a, that the real distinction in organizing is between the mean, nasty axiom buster who's in your face versus the nice, friendly guy who says, well, here, read this nice newspaper and maybe you'll like us to call you back. I, I didn't say when Boomerang. Okay. <laughs> just, we get All right, go ahead. But um, how, do you, how do you get somebody to understand... Uh, the importance of actually working with LaRouche as opposed to you know, how do you organize them to a personality instead of an idea? I mean, I can organize people to principles and you know, I can tell them what LaRouche is doing, but there's like a disconnect where I'll get people excited about an idea or a principle. Well, what, is it, what is it that you think comes up around LaRouche in most people? What Why do you think people have a problem? If, if you were saying, I'm going to teach you the laws of planetary motion, and you said, by the way, that means we're going to talk about Kepler. Do people go, Kepler? Forget it. I'm not going to deal with that guy. I just want to learn about the planets. Does that ever happen, Ed? 
<laughs> so what is it about LaRouche? What, what do you think the problem is? I mean, I, I feel like if I could actually get, you know, I tell them, look, this is who LaRouche really is. I'm just truthful about it. And then, I, you know, I'm tempted to head off slanders and head off, you know, all sorts of psychological warfare bullshit, you know, that, that mm-hmm. you dealing with the effects of that. But, um, <coughs> See, I think that the only way to do it is go right up front. I'm with LaRouche. He's the guy who's, who's advanced the, the science of economics so that we can get out of this depression. Now, you say something like that, the first thing you have is someone say depression or LaRouche or science of economics <laughs> or Ed Park. <laughs> I used to go play in Ed Park. <laughs> No, so look, what you do is you, you, you put a, a statement forward with a lot of polemics in it, a lot of paradoxes. And then someone says something like, well, you know, I, I can't go along with that. And you had me there up until you mentioned LaRouche. So, so truth is okay until something comes up that's controversial. You know, what I usually say is, what do you really know about LaRouche? Do you really know anything about LaRouche or are you listening to gossip? Now, then you get, occasionally you get some guy like, we ran into this thing uh, up in San Leandro, a reporter asked, the, because we were all over the Sacramento hearing, a reporter went up to one of the state representatives and said, well, do you think that LaRouche really has a role to play in this thing? I said, I don't know, why not? So then the reporter said, don't you know who he is? I met him in 1984. He's a crook. He's this, he's that. That's a reporter who's supposed to be interviewing a guy, not organizing him. So, you know, what you find is that there's been a deliberate effort to smear LaRouche so that people won't get this principle. That's the tragedy. If you just believe that someone's bad because an authority said it, I mean, here's, here's an interesting thing to ask people. You know, if LaRouche is so bad, why is he welcome in any government in the world? What is it that people all over the world know that we Americans don't know? Hmm? You can pose that to someone. LaRouche's writings are being translated into Russian. So that Sergei Glazyev and people like that can fight to save their nation from the International Monetary Fund. Sergei Glazyev has studied LaRouche, have you? Dr. Anais Carnero has studied LaRouche, have you? Lopez Portillo has studied LaRouche, have you? That's not that bad. Give me 25 bucks, I'll give you some books. You can study LaRouche. I mean, the, the basic point is, you got to separate the hysteria, which is media-induced and, and so on, from the real person. Look, I really think most people want to know what's going on. But they can get by with watching MTV News and think they're well-informed. You know, they can find out if Madonna's wearing her bra inside or outside of her clothes this week. And they think they know something. Or what's the latest, you know, Britney Spears got dumped by Pepsi. What's the real story? I mean, that's, most people just aren't interested in, in, in these things. But I think they really are. It's just that they don't know what they can do. So you very calmly say to someone, you know, it's funny you bring this, this up, because I've been talking to a lot of people who are completely oblivious to the world crisis, who've been saying the same thing. Now, you just told me you're interested in this and that, but you're not interested in LaRouche. So, you know, what's wrong with your thinking? Just don't be defensive about it. If you get defensive, then the idiots have you. And there's no reason to be defensive. Lynn is, a, is an open book. Yeah? Um, what would you be able to say to inspire someone instead of bringing them down like I do sometimes when they say no? What can the common man do about this? What can I do? Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, there's 
a lot. You should join our order. He's got a stupid thing. Why? I don't, yeah. Look, we've got a movement. We've got a youth movement. Those of you who are part of the LaRouche youth movement are changing history. Why would you be embarrassed by telling someone to join our youth movement? You want to learn about the world? You want to go change history? Join us. We're changing history. Now, someone might say, what do you mean? And you can discuss that. But the, the key thing is, look, we get frustrated. We look at the world. It, when you first get an idea, I'm sure this is happening to Torin a little bit and other people who are just starting to organize. You get an idea. You work hard on it. All of a sudden, you've got it. You're excited about the idea. And then you go out and try to talk to people about the idea, and you can't even get past the, the first sentence. And so you start getting frustrated. And you finally get to someone who seems somewhat bright, and then they completely freak out on you. So you start to think, oh, this will never work. You've got to be calm. You have to have a certain amount of confidence. We're moving governments. And the fact that you're, the person you're talking to might have just spent the last six hours catching up on their, you know, they were on vacation, so they had to watch the, the soap operas they missed. You know, I mean, most people are other directed. That means their identity comes from something outside of themselves. So you have a little bit of compassion for them. They've got problems. You help them see what, how things really work. You know, if they freak out, they freak out. So what? Yeah. Well, when he was speaking in the Mexican Cosmic School, he said, you know, I smell victory, and mm-hmm. I want you to smell it, too. Yeah. That, I mean, you see what everything that we've been, every goal we set out to do, we've accomplished. Dumping, leave women in the cane, boards out, you know, Kissinger's out, and you don't lend the out, you know, what, um, you know, probably... Blair's in trouble. Blair's mm-hmm. in trouble, you know, the food is being exposed, corrupt, and, you know... Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, we said earlier what LaRouche is doing internationally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, if people are, I mean, I know I'm more excited now than I have the first time I've been in this organization in terms of just everything we've been fighting for is happening. And then beyond that, the other thing that's most exciting, because we've got a lot of people now here, people from different backgrounds, different areas of, of expertise, you can sit down and have incredibly wonderful discussions. You can talk about Plato. When you get to know something about these things, it's really exciting. Because you sit down and you can actually begin to discuss ideas with someone. You may have seen it differently. That's fine. That's what a dialogue is. You know, so all of these things, you, know, you, you begin to discover that you're not just thinking about the world, but as Schiller said, Schiller said he wrote his dramas so you could change the world. Not just see it or read about it, but change it. This idea of being an actor on the stage of history. The idea that your life is worth living because you're doing something for all mankind. The average person can't say that. The average person is barely trying to survive through the next paycheck. And if you give someone that sense of the possibilities. See, one of the other things about drama is this concept of the punctum salience. That you come to a point in the drama where there's a fork in the road. And, you know, unlike Yogi Berra, who says, when there's a fork in the road, take it. Yeah. Normal people have to choose one way or the other. So what do you do? This brings up an interesting point, if it's on a stage. Because now what you're trying to figure out is what are the possibilities, the potentiality from each direction. If you don't act, what will happen? If you act precipitously, what will happen? But if you think it through, what is the potential? And of course, in tragedy, they always take the wrong turn, the wrong path. And so then you're, you come back to this question of, okay, what would I have done? How could I have done differently? Because Linton and Helga have both been raising this question, which I did in the, the presentation I gave a couple of weeks ago on Saturday, of was it inevitable that Hitler would come to power? There was an alternative to Hitler's policy, which was the Lautenbach plan. There was an economic policy that could have saved Germany without the Nazis coming in. It would have been very much like what FDR did in the United States. So why did Hitler come to power? This is a tragedy, because people who knew better didn't act. 
Von Schleicher was in power. He didn't act. He dilly-dallied. The political parties, the Socialist Party, should have known better. They didn't act. So today, you use history to show people what happens when there's a crisis and either the wrong decision is made or no decision is made. Usually, it's a tragedy. Now, here we are today. Here are the alternatives. What are you going to do? That's, that's organizing. <clears throat> and then you say, now, here's what we're doing. We got this movement going. We're taking on the legislature. We're taking on the Congress. We're organizing Hungary. Now, tomorrow I have a meeting with a, a group of Russian scientists who emigrated from Russia and live in the United States, people with enormous capabilities, some of whom are driving cabs. How can we have a, a nation that's supposed to be so great that has something like, I think, 1,500 or maybe it's, maybe it's 20,000, I can't remember, the, I think it's 20,000 Russian scientists with degrees have emigrated to this country and three quarters of them are employed in, in menial labor. In Israel, you have uh, these Russians who emigrated to Israel. Classical violinists working as janitors. You know, they used to have this joke in Israel, what do you call a Russian who when they emigrate to Israel gets off the plane and doesn't have a violin or a viola? You call them a pianist. Because they were all classically trained. So now you have all these people in the United States. Are they employed? They're employed way below what they could do. Why don't we take advantage of that potential labor power? That potential scientific capability? So you always look for the potential. And you organize people around that optimistically. Um, there was another hand up here a few seconds ago. I, I know sooner or later I'm going to get a stream of questions from Diana. Right now she's sitting there very quiet. Anyone else? Did you have your hand up, Aaron? No, somebody did. Is that it? You guys are done? Yeah. Yeah, there are a bunch of things. I mean, the, the Palestinians uncovered an attempt by the Mossad to carry out a bombing using Palestinians who were recruited by essentially what was a Mossad operation. That the Israelis have certain Arabs who are recruited to them who are getting recruiting these Palestinians and preparing some kind of mega terrorist act that could be blamed on Al Qaeda which would then be used as a pretext for Sharon to go in and kill Arafat and destroy what's left of the Palestinian Authority infrastructure. And so the Palestinians not only had this one guy come to them who, who was suspicious of his recruitment process, but the, they checked it out and they found that the emails and the, the cell phones were being routed through Mossad headquarters. So they have all these records. They presented this at a press conference. There were U.S. press there. But this story is not coming out. It finally came out in a British newspaper. It's been in a lot of the Arab press. But, of course, what they're saying is, well, this is just a Palestinian trick. Now, the interesting thing is that Sharon is in big trouble right now. And there's a chance that Mitzna could win the election. But Mitzna said something interesting today. You know, when Lynn came out about a month ago and said, this is an interesting campaign, and a lot of you were probably saying, ah, forget it, Sharon will win there's going to be terrorism and war. Well, you know what Mitzna came out and said today? The Likud is funded by international organized crime. <laughs> now, anybody who knows us is going to say, Mitzna must be a Larushi. Because <laughs> we've written a book on how the, this network, and Lynn was asked this question, what about the Jewish component and the chicken hawks, the utopians? And Lynn said it's not a Jewish component because there are two branches of Judaism reflected in, in the uh, Middle East, one of which is that of, of Jabotinsky, who for all intents and purposes has, has abandoned Judaism. They've turned Judaism into a blood and soil cult. 
We are the Zionists. We claim this land. You're intruders. We're going to kick you off. And that's final. That's Sharon. That's Netanyahu. But then you have what, what I started calling, and Lynn picked up on it, the, the, the competing tendency, which is the real tendency in Judaism. The Judaism of the three Moses. Moses, the lawgiver, and, and the, the one of Passover who took the Jews out of bondage in Egypt. Moses Maimonides, the scholar who worked with the, the classical Greek network in the Islamic world in the 11th century, 12th century rather. And then Moses Mendelssohn, who modernized Judaism in Europe and said Judaism is an ideal, it's a religion, it's a, a way of thinking about yourself in the world. It's not a blood and soil cult. It's not a nation. And so you have Mitzna, who represents the tradition of Rabin and the tradition of Ben-Gurion, who's saying that if there's going to be a state of Israel, it must be guided on the highest level by natural law. Because that's what Judaism is supposed to represent. Not be a corrupt nation. Now what do you find with the Likud? Well, there's a big expose. The Likud chose their candidates for the parliament based on who gave the most money to the people who run the party? Corruption scandal. Two Likud leaders were put in jail today in Israel. One of them, one of the guys who was involved in the bribery scandal, was the chief security guard for the Likud party, including for Sharon. Now, another guy who's implicated in the bribery is the guy who ran the security service at Logan Airport that supposedly allowed the 9-11 terrorists to get in and steal the plane. Now, here's something interesting. Huh? An Israeli security service was the ones that, that filmed these guys coming through but didn't catch them. Hmm? Did you know that the Israelis were running... I mean, I think if the, if the Israeli government was really running it, none of us would ever get on a plane. <laughs> So obviously they were letting people get on a plane that they thought might hijack a plane. And there's been a lot of uh, said, a lot said about this company in Boston that they were no good. Now it turns out friends of Sharon own it. So it's getting interesting. Now if Mitzna continues to go with this, the Likud guy today said we've got to postpone the election because it's unfair to have an election when you're slandering your opponents. It's completely wrong. That's the best time to do it. Find out who you're really running against. There are a bunch of crooks and gamblers and, and dope dealers. Let's get them. Then maybe we can clean up Israel. The Israelis will go back to the Rabin policy. We can have peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And then Richard Pearl and Wolfowitz will have to go to a paintball field to have their fun or something <laughs> instead of blowing up nations. So the Israeli situation is really quite interesting right now. And we were playing a big role in it because we were the ones who went to Mitzvah in the first place. And we didn't just say, look, these are some pretty bad guys who, who are opposing you. We said these are the worst drug dealing, drug money laundering scumbags that ever lived in Israel. And Mitzvah said, tell me more. <laughs> That's the kind of politician we like. I'll take one, one more question, Ed. What do you think is going on with North Korea? I mean, I, what, I, what I've seen is that um, North Korea clearly wants to take advantage of um, economic and diplomatic, mm -hmm. uh, increasing economic and diplomatic cooperation amongst everybody in its neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? but, but also trying to reciprocate on what Kim Dae-jung has been doing and, and move that forward. But then the Bush administration is trying to blow that up with a lot of yeah, it's, it's really quite simple. The, the Bush administration, not, not Bush per se, Wolfowitz and others put North Korea on the axis of evil. They want to blow it up. Now, the North Koreans are leaking all these things about nuclear weapons and this and that because they want to force the discussion of, of a real peace. And what is the main impetus for peace? Well, that you have a, a, a potential adversary who's armed and dangerous. You know, if they just look like a nation falling apart with no threat, they're going to get left out. 
And so Lynn thinks that what they're doing is they're doing a few things that are somewhat provocative to basically say, hey, look, let's get to work on this. Now, the problem is you got these elections coming up in, in South Korea where it's possible it will either be a deadlock in the parliament or a close vote, which will leave someone without a clear mandate to go ahead with the sunshine policy. So it's, it's a very dangerous moment there. So the North Koreans are taking a big gamble. Sort of like Iran. Look what the Iranians did the other day. They disclosed that they have a nuclear plant that, that they'd not previously acknowledged. Now, they did it because they were asked, do you have anything that you haven't told us? So they said, well, yeah, under the nuclear nonproliferation, we should admit we've got this plant. Now they're being attacked for it. So they did what they're supposed to do, and they're like, oh, we better watch out for the Iranians. So, you know, in, in, when you have international diplomacy, which is run by some, where there are some people involved who want to have wars, you sometimes have to take a risk to avoid war. But it's not like they found out, right, when they told us. Like, didn't we already know about this stuff anyways? It just kind of now it's come, come Well, now it's being used to whip it up. I mean, the main thing is the Russians... I didn't the, well, the Russians and the Chinese are trying to, to work with North Korea. And the Japanese now, and they're saying the United States cut the nonsense. Let's let's make the world a better place. Why do you think Lieberman picked up the North Korean? He's actually recommending that the United States buy out the North Korean the North Korean weapons program wholesale. Yeah, maybe he wants to provide it to. I mean, I don't know. I, I really don't know what Lieberman is doing on any particular issue. In terms of his overall posture, he's no good. I mean, he, as I pointed out earlier, even someone who's no good occasionally does something that's good. Like Kissinger, he resigned. <laughs> that was the first good thing he's done in a long time. <laughs> All right, so look, we've got some work to do over the next couple of weeks. We've got a lot of these legislators are in the district now, and we should be going to visit them. Uh, one of the things, whoever's in the office tomorrow should make some calls to all the legislators in the L.A. area and find out if they're going to have town meetings, if they're going to have events. I think there's something like 30 legislators in this area. And so you know, maybe what we can do is with our deployments, start some of our deployments, start the day by going down and uh, greeting the staff of a state legislator and what they should do. And uh, we want to meet with them. We want them to bring LaRouche in and so on. So we need volunteers to join us, to come out and organize with us, uh, to participate in the, the ongoing educational process. Uh, Robert, who was here earlier, is, uh, has started again this workshop on one of Shakespeare's great plays. He, he's gone now. But he wanted to make sure that anybody who's not already working with us on the Julius Caesar project, we're going to take up some new scenes in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and, you know, it's a good time to get started. So he'll be here Sunday at 4.30 for that. Do we have Plato this Sunday? So you can go very nicely from Plato at 4:30, or from uh, drama at 4:30 to Plato after that, and then I'm sure the the mad doctor Sky Shields is going to dazzle you and wow you on what you don't know about numbers till as late as you can stay awake. That's right. You can join us any day of the week, and so we we also, by the way, are going to have our next cadre school here. Uh, either the 24th or the 31st, that's the Friday, so it would be the 25th or February 1st. Uh, we, we just have to, we may be changing the date because I, I it's something I discovered today, but uh, you certainly would want to be at this. We'll, we'll engage in a dialogue with Lyndon LaRouche. We'll have a series of classes. We're, we're probably going to have Jeff and Michelle Steinberg. Michelle is the editor of the EIW and Jeff is the uh, basically the counterintelligence expert. Actually, by the way, if you, have a, if you have five more minutes, I'll tell you something I just discovered on this presentation I gave at the last cadre school on organized crime and rap. Uh, this is actually a fascinating breakthrough in, in the investigation having to do with this. Uh, are you interested? Yeah. We've got a couple more minutes? Okay. I didn't want to impose on you. MCA, Music Corporation of America. Uh, which also could have been called Mafia Corporation of America. This was a company that had on its board members of the Genovese crime family, 
the Colombo crime family, and the um, well, the Cavalcante, which is much smaller. Vinny the Chin Gigante <laughs> was he assigned a guy named Morris Levy. Now Levy, I mentioned to you at the cadre school. Morris Levy went to work for MCA and brought a group of mobsters on something called the Network. Now, the network was people from MCA, CBS Records, and one or two of the other record companies who would meet once a week to then send out their recommendations to disc jockeys all over the country as to which records should be played. And so it was this group, and they would do it. They would give you know, free albums to the disc jockeys, uh, groupies, you know, whatever these guys wanted, a lot of money. But it was a group of people who was primarily made up of mobsters, uh, coordinated through MCA, that were determining what records were listened to in the 70s. Now, in 1979, a relatively small record company in New Jersey called Sugar Hill Records was basically taken over by Morris Levy. And they put out the first rap record. Called the rappers, De- or I think it's rappers delight. Yeah, yeah. Now the, they, they had an African American guy who was running the company on money provided by Vinny the Chin Gigante and Morris Levy. Now in the early 80s, the Justice Department started investigating this, not because of rap, but because of the, the billions of dollars in this. And by the way. You've been watching recently a briefing about the Universal, the, the Bronfman family losing billions of dollars. Universal was part of MCA. It was taken over by the Bronfman family, which is one of the original organized crime families from Prohibition. So this continues to the present. Well, in 1983, a hundred count indictment came out against the Genovese family, Colombo family, Morris Levy, and others. And it looked like they were going to move in to clean up the record industry. Now, of course, MCA, besides its its record, had Universal Pictures, Universal Studios, Vicky knows, which at the time was run by a guy named Lou Wasserman. Lou Wasserman was the guy who promoted Ronald Reagan. Lou Wasserman came out of Cleveland Organized Crime Networks. His attorney in Los Angeles was a man named Stanley Korshak, who was the fixer for the mob in Los Angeles for 30 years. So movies, records, this was a mob operation. So the Justice Department started moving in. So MCA was about to be shut down as a criminal enterprise. And by the way, when we talk about gangster rap, the original gangster rap was right here. Okay? (laughs) They didn't wear do-rags, but this was the original gangster rap. They didn't know FUBU from, from Phoebe. <laughs> but these were the guys who ran this stuff. Now, here's the interesting thing. MCA had on their board two guys who were quite important. One was named Robert Strauss, and the other Felix Rowett. You know who these guys are? Robert Strauss is one of the fixers in the Democratic Party for 30 years. He's with a law firm called Aiken, Gump, Something, and Strauss. The original Forrest Gump. <laughs> Felix Rowetton was the chairman of the board of Lazard Frere, which is one of the leading investment banks in the country. These two guys, this is the financial oligarchy of Wall Street. Now, When the Justice Department exposed the organized crime involvement in MCA, did these guys come and say, oh my goodness, this is terrible, let's fire these guys, get rid of them, clean up our company? Do you think they did that? What do you think they did? They hired a law firm. They hired a man, and this is really the new great stuff that I came up with. William Hundley. Hundley in the 50s was one of the chiefs of the criminal division of the Department of Justice. Hundley then went from the criminal division of the Department of Justice 
to become the in-house lawyer for the Meyer-Lansky mob through something called Intertel, which was basically an intelligence company connected to uh, uh, Resorts International, which was where Lansky was laundering uh, uh, drug money. And so Hundley was hired by this company. He became the fixer for the mob. Whenever the Justice Department would move in on these guys, they'd hire him. He'd go back to his old buddies in the criminal division, which, by the way, included the people who prosecuted LaRouche in the 80s. Hundley would go in and convince them to drop the charges. Now, he would do it by bringing with him the highest-priced lawyers in the country who would defend the mobsters, and the Justice Department always argued that you can't really prosecute organized crime because they have more money to spend than the government. Now... So Strauss brought in Aiken Gump under Hundley. They had Aiken Gump and another firm called Tall Weiss Rifkin, which is the most powerful law firm for many years on Wall Street. Now, these guys ended up representing the mobsters. And the guy from the Colombo family, whose name I forget, oh, Pistoli. Uh, Sal Pistoli. His lawyer was Roy Cohn, who was one of the people who was involved in the Get LaRouche Task Force, an organized crime mob lawyer from way back. So this grouping won the case and got the charges dropped against these guys, who then went full force into rap. They, they spun off a whole bunch of new labels that basically became the core of the, the development of rap, including Def Jam, you know, Russell Simmons, who came out of this, this, from New York, out of this grouping. And also out here, the group that became Death Row, now called The Row. And most of the Puffy Combs, P. Diddy, or whatever he calls himself now, financed by the same operation. So when, when I did this thing on who owns your culture, I had the basic overview. But now we're actually getting, I can show you pictures of Vinny the Chin Gigante. When he was taken to court, he, he went in in pajamas. He sort of had the Mike Vandernat look. Uh, he never left his house. So you see this, this mobster walking down the street in pajamas with an a, you know, $800 London Fog raincoat over it. Uh, one of the other guys who, who was uh, uh, Joe Iscro was the person who ran the group called The Network, which uh, decided which records were listened to. And he had his face broken up by these guys because they thought he was going to testify against them. So it's a, a brutal, brutal story. But what you find is that, in fact, what these guys did with the so-called artists is they picked out people who were disposable. They build them up for a while and then blow them away. I think if the truth eventually comes out, you're going to find that there was no East Coast, West Coast uh, gangster rap confrontation. You know, the, the Biggie Smalls and P. Diddy killed Tupac and then Suge Knight went out and killed Biggie Smalls. I think you'll probably find mafia rub outs. You build, because you can sell more records after you're dead, which is what's happened. You create myths, heroes. Jim Morrison became much bigger after he was dead than when he was alive. So this is our culture. Huh? This is what is the tragedy. Because then people hear that and they say, that speaks to my heart. Yeah, it's Vinny the Chin Gigante speaking to your heart, buddy. <laughs> you would never have heard that if it wasn't for the chin. So we've got to organize. We've got to defeat these guys. We need a real human culture. So that's, that's what I've got for you. Good night.